almost any scenario that is realistic will overwhelm the capacity of the current healthcare system. So, little reality. Keep the curve down as low as you can, but you cannot get the curve down low enough so that you don't overwhelm the hospital capacity. So any of these scenarios, we have to increase the hospital capacity. And that's why we're literally adding to the hospital capacity every way we can. That's what the Javits Hospital is about. That's what the Stony Brook Hospital is about. That's what Westchester Convention Center, that's what the old Westbury additional site is. We're also scouting new sites now uh, all across primarily the downstate area of this state for possible sites. Our goal is to have a 1,000 plus overflow facility in each of the boroughs downstate in the counties. Queens, Brooklyn, the New York City boroughs, Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, and Long Island, Nassau, Suffolk, and Westchester, and Rockland. So every county has a 1,000 plus bed overflow facility. And that's what we're working on at the same time, as well as increasing the capacity of the existing hospital system. Uh, as we've said, the hospitals have a 53,000 bed capacity. We're trying to get to 140,000 bed capacity between the hospitals and the overflow facilities. Uh, we've mandated that the hospitals increase their capacity by 50%. We've asked them to try to increase it 100%, but they have to increase it 50%. We're also scouting dorms, scouting hotels for uh, emergency beds, and that's going well. Uh, equipment and PPE is an ongoing issue. Right now, we do have enough PPE for the immediate future. Uh, the New York City hospital system confirmed that uh, so we have enough in stock now for the immediate need. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. I didn't know what they were a few weeks ago. Besides the cursory knowledge, I know too much about ventilators now. We're still shopping for ventilators all across uh, the country. We need more. We have approved a technology that allows one ventilator to serve two patients, what they call splitting which is where you add a second set of tubes to a ventilator to do two patients. It's not ideal, but we believe it's workable. We're also converting anesthesia machines to ventilators. Uh, we have a couple of thousand anesthesia machines in our hospitals, and we're converting them to work as ventilators. Why is there such a demand on ventilators, and where did this come from? It's a respiratory illness for a large number of people. So uh, they all need ventilators. Also, non-COVID patients are normally on ventilators for three to four days. COVID patients are on ventilators for 11 to 21 days. Think about that. So you don't have the same turnaround uh, in the number of ventilators. If somebody's on ventilator for three or four days, that's one level of ventilators you need. If somebody's on for 11 to 21 days, that's a totally different equation. And that's what we're dealing with. The high number of COVID patients and the long period of time that they actually need a ventilator. We're also working on equalizing and distributing the load of patients. Right now, the number of cases is highest downstate New York. Uh, so we're working on a collaboration where we, in, we distribute the load between downstate hospitals and upstate hospitals. And we're also working on increasing the capacity for upstate hospitals. Shifting now to a totally different field, the economic. So that was his press conference from March 26th. Let's listen to his uh, press conference on March 29th. Again, I'm just showing snippets of his directives that 
directly impacted how the integrated delivery systems in the state of New York were forced to adopt. They were, as he says, mandated. They were not, the hospitals were not asked nicely by the governor. They were told by the governor. They were mandated by virtue of his state executive powers and also from the executive order uh, emanating from his um, declaration of um, state of emergency. So let's listen to this one from March 29th. Continue to go up all across the state. So for a local health system, this is a new challenge. Uh, most health systems have public hospitals and then they have private hospitals or uh, volunteer, voluntary hospitals. And they basically exist on a day-to-day -day basis as two different systems. So you'll have public hospitals and then you have the private uh, hospital system. And for all intents and purposes, in normal operating procedures, they operate as two systems, there's very little interaction. There's also very little interaction among individual hospitals, sometimes even within the own, their own system. So you have public hospitals that are part of a public hospital system, but each hospital basically operates on its own, right? Has its own identity. Uh, certainly true on the private side, where you have individual hospitals and they operate on their own. We have to change that mentality. And we have to change that mentality quickly. Uh, no hospital is an island. No hospital uh, in this situation can exist unto, its, un, unto themselves. We really have to have a new mentality, a new culture of hospitals working with one another, both within the public system as well as the private system, and we need to think about the public system working with the private system in a way they never have before. There is an artificial wall, almost, between those two systems right now. Uh, that, ha that wall has to come down. That theory has to come down. This is going to be all hands on deck. This is everybody helping everyone else. Uh, one hospital gets overwhelmed. The other hospitals have to have to flex to help that hospital and vice versa. The, we have Elmhurst Hospital, for example, in New York City uh, that is under stress. Uh, the number of cases in the Elmhurst Hospital is high. When the number of cases is high, the stress on the staff is high. Uh, I was just speaking with Dr. Zucker about this. You do this for two, three, four weeks, the level of stress is very intense. Elmhurst Hospital is part of a public health system uh, of about 11 hospitals in New York City. That system has to work together, and those hospitals have to work together, uh, the 11 health and hospital uh, in New York City, the public system. Uh, and I'm going to ask Mayor de Blasio and Controller Stringer to take a look at the system and figure out how we can get that system uh, to work better together uh, as a unified system. This is not going to get better soon, right? So Elmhurst is under stress now. That stress does not abate for the foreseeable short-term future. So how do we make that system uh, work better together? Uh, and what recommendations do we have to improve H&H. Uh, &H. We'll also be meeting with the private hospitals in New York City that are organized through something called the Greater New York Hospital Association. I'm going to be meeting with them tomorrow to talk about having those hospitals also uh, organize, act as one, get out of their silos, get out of their identities to work together. And then overall, you have these local health systems the state's role, which we've never really done before, is getting those health systems to work with one another. So we talked about if New York City gets overwhelmed, we'll ask the upstate systems to be a relief valve for the downstate health systems, which has never happened before to any scale, uh, and also vice versa. 
there will be a time where the upstate hospitals will be struggling. And when the upstate hospitals will be struggling, then we want the downstate hospitals to be able to take over uh, and relieve those hospitals. That's actually the advantage of the rolling curve that they're projecting. If it does happen that way, theoretically, the, the I almost think of it as, as a high tide mark, right? High tide comes first in New York City, then the tide is on the way down, and then it's high tide in upstate New York. Okay, so if, it's, if the tide is dropping downstate, then you have some relief for the upstate hospitals. So this is really very interesting because even Governor Cuomo was saying this has never happened before. But in terms of policy, it appears that what he did was he has injected the might and the power of the state in how the workflows are going to be. He's basically forcing this integrated delivery systems to work together. And he pointed out that there is a public health integrated delivery system that's all the government hospitals state uh, city and then you have the private nonprofit voluntary hospitals um, in this particular uh, press conference he basically inserted a state into the mix the state the new the state of new york into the mix in basically forcing these two entities two separate entities, public and private integrated delivery systems to work together. This press conference on March 30th. Here we go. Mission two, and this is going to be more and more clear as we go on. The frontline battle is in the healthcare system. The frontline battle is going to be hospitals across the city, across the state, and across this nation. That is where this battle is fought. It's that simple. You know exactly where it's coming. You know exactly where the enemy is going to attack. They're going to infect a large number of people. That number of people descend on the health care system. The health care system can't deal with that number of people you overwhelm the healthcare system. That's what's happening. So, first step was flatten the curve, reduce the density, keep people home. We've done everything that we can possibly do there. Second step is don't let the hospital system get overwhelmed. The soldiers in this fight are our healthcare professionals. It's the doctors, it's the nurses, it's the people who are working in the hospitals, it's the aides. They are the soldiers who are fighting this battle for us. You know the expression, save our troops, troops, quote unquote. In this battle, the troops are healthcare professionals. Those are the troops who are fighting this battle for us. We need to recruit more healthcare workers. We need to share healthcare professionals within this state and within this country. As governor of New York, I am asking healthcare professionals across the country, if you don't have a healthcare crisis in your community, please come help us in New York now. We need relief. We need relief for nurses who are working 12-hour uh, shifts, one after the other after the other. We need relief for doctors. We need relief for attendants. So if you're not busy, come help us, please. And we will return the favor. We will return the favor. New York, yes, we have it now intensely. There will be a curve. New York at one point will be on the other side of the curve, and then there will be an intense issue somewhere else in the nation. And the New York way is to be helpful. So help New York. We're the ones who are hit now. That's today, but tomorrow it's going to be somewhere else. Whether it's Detroit, whether it's New Orleans, it will work its way across the country. 
So this is really interesting because look at this. Share healthcare professionals within the state and among the states. This is something quite novel. This never happens in the United States because we do not have a universal healthcare system. In countries with universal healthcare systems, most if not all decision making is done by the government because all authority in terms of uh, managing resources, where should the doctors be, where should the hospitals be, that is the sole decision of the government. But because we don't have a single unified system that we might call a universal healthcare system, this is what's happening and everything has been laid to bear with this pandemic. Let's continue listening to him. Uh, we have about seven more minutes in this, um, in this snippet from his press conference on March 30th. And this is the time for us to help one another. We need supplies. March 31st. The point that every morning you get up. Uh, yesterday we met with the entire state hospital system. Dr. Zucker and our team First time they were all in one place. And we said to the hospital system, look, what I just said to you, we're dealing with a war, we're dealing with a war we've never dealt with before. We need a totally different mindset and organizational transformation. We can't do business the way we have always done business. We need an unprecedented sense of cooperation, of flexibility, communication, and speed. Uh, and that's what we talked through yesterday and we have to do it now. The healthcare system is one of those uh, balkanized systems. It's like our state education system. It's like our criminal justice system. Uh, it's in place. It's fragmented. Uh, they have their own identities, their own associations. It's regionally organized. That all has to change. We don't have the ability to meet the capacity of our healthcare system as an entirety. That assumes the healthcare system is working as an entirety. That's not how the healthcare system is organized now. We have New York City hospitals, and then we have Long Island hospitals, and then we have Westchester hospitals, and then we have upstate hospitals. That has to go. Even in New York City, you have two basic hospital systems in New York City. You have the private hospitals, voluntary hospitals, about 160 of them, which are some of the finest healthcare institutions in the United States of America. You know, uh, this is uh, Mount Sinai, Columbia Presbyterian, etc. Uh, some of their members are also upstate, but they're the large uh, private institutions. Greater New York Hospital Association. Ken Rasky runs that association of 160. You then have in New York City, the public hospitals, the uh, New York City Health uh, and Hospitals Corporation. They are 11 public hospitals. Uh, they are uh, a universe, and then you have the private hospitals as a separate universe. The 11 public hospitals are the hospitals that in many ways have always been under greater stress and greater need. We have to get those two systems, the private system and the public system in New York City, working together in a way they never did before. The distinction of private, public, that has to go out the window. We are one healthcare system. On top of that, it can't be the downstate hospitals and the upstate hospitals and the Long Island hospitals. When we talk about capacity of beds, when I say we now have 75,000 beds, that's a statewide number. That means those beds have to be available to the people in New York City or Nassau, even if those beds are up in Albany. So combining that whole system, and you're no longer just the Western New York hospitals or the uh, Central New York hospitals, it's one coordinated system. It's much easier said than done, but we have to do it. On top of that, you have to overlay the new federal beds that came in. 
that are an entirely new component. We have Javits Center 2,500 beds. We have uh, the USNS Comfort of 1,000 beds. We're planning other federal facilities. These all have to be coordinated on top of the existing hospital network. So you see the organizational uh, situation that we're dealing with. And uh, let's be honest and let's learn from the past. We know where we have to focus. We know where we're going to have problems in the next hospitals because the hospitals that have the least capacity that have already been stressed are the hospitals that are not going to be able to handle the additional load. That is a fact. You know which hospitals were struggling. We do reports all the time about the financial capacity of hospitals and, and what hospitals are in stronger versus weaker position. The hospitals that are in a weaker position are the hospitals that are going to suffer when they then carry an ad added burden. That was Elmhurst Hospital. It happened to be a public hospital. It happened to be a public hospital in a place of density. It happened to get overwhelmed. Uh, and that's what, the, then you saw the burden on the staff. Uh, you saw the emotion, you saw, saw the stress. That can't happen. And that's what we talked about yesterday. Uh, and people said, well, El Elmhurst isn't my responsibility. Uh, Elmhurst is a public hospital. The city runs it. I don't run it. It's New York City. It's not a, pub, a private hospital. I don't care which link breaks in the chain. The chain is still broken. It doesn't matter which hospital, which link. Any link breaks, the chain breaks. So, as of today, April 28th, we already know that we are going down from our epidemic curve apex. Um, the number of hospitalization, number of intubations, number of um, people needing ventilators, and especially, most remarkably, the number of deaths uh, are now half of what we had in our peak about two weeks ago. So we are definitely going down our curve. But one thing we realized is that it's clear that the way the health and medical systems operate is going to change. Is uh, his press conference on Monday, wherein he was asking actually the federal government if some of the surge capacity hospitals, such as the one in Javits Center um, and all the other places um, could be kept in place because of the upcoming uh, flu season. So let's listen. We have medical centers that were built. I spoke to uh, President Trump about this this morning. When we were worried about the lack of capacity in the hospital system, uh, the federal government was good enough to send in the Army Corps of Engineers. They did a phenomenal job in building beds quickly. We built a number of facilities. We're now talking about possibility of a second wave of the COVID virus or COVID combining with the regular flu season in September, which could be problematic again for the hospital capacity. Uh, so the facilities that were built, I spoke to the president about leaving them in place until we get through the flu season. God forbid we need extra capacity again. Uh, I don't wanna have built ask the federal government to build capacity, then take it down, and then wind up in another problem area. Uh, Javits Center, we have to think about, because the Javits Center is in the Javits Convention Center. To wrap this video up, uh, obviously, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, this pandemic is not over yet, and, you know, obviously, New York and pause is not over yet. Um, the New York and pause, which is a stay at home order, actually, uh, other people call it a lockdown, is in effect until May 15th. And today is April 28th, 
as I made this video. So we will yet have to see uh, how this all pans out. But one thing we know is that in terms of operation for integrated delivery systems, especially surge capacity, um, we have seen all these things change, unravel, hopefully improve for the better because of this pandemic.